right good morning. good morning so i start with a question and question says how many of you go for a facial so we are in a so we are in a business of a beauty right so how many of you go for a facial oh yeah so th that that's a trigger for us right so even people say that they are beauty conscious they look and they want to look better but they never admit they go for a facial right so from that particular note i welcome you over here for a research proposal presentation which is focusing on the beauty the masculinity and the choice for a particular service when it comes to the beauty services altogether so moving ahead if we look upon the background of the problem in indian context if we look upon india particularly dominantly is supposed to be a male oriented society when it comes to more of a stronger masculine robust kind of a framework and over the period of time the things has been so conceptually profounded that when it comes to beauty it is always female dominated whether we talk of an animal kingdom from a smaller context or we look from our goddess and god's perspective and even to the normal flora and fauna in which we are living up so from that particular aspect if we look the shadow of being beautiful is changing and men are equally barging in into a new field where they are saying that yes we are also conscious about our beauty and that is what is the starting point of this particular research proposed presentation which says yes the market is growing and if you look upon males are overgrowing overgrown in fact the women in terms of their preference for beauty services from that particular note we focused on the importance and relevance of this particular presentation which is saying that yes being a marketeer you cannot say no to this particular new segment which is coming up which is having more purchasing power and which is basically the buyer of this particular service therefore the literature has been taken care of where we try to look upon the hornis model for the personality which is a compliant aggressive and a detached personality we try to look upon this model from the perspective of how this model interkeys with reference to the purchasing behavior and we try to see yes there is a vast difference when it comes to the purchasing power the purchasing preferences across the three different types of personality what i discussed earlier which is a compliant aggressive and a detached so on this particular note the iv and dv framework what we have taken care upon is the compliant personality type as the iv the preference towards the beauty service as that dv and we are using masculinity is one of our moderator where we are using the scale of masculinity behavior scale where we are saying that being a men how masculinity comes over in terms of how strongly the feeling of men and orientation towards men versus relevance of that particular feeling is to be taken care upon to go further if we look upon the experimental study is what we are proposed in this particular paper with a specific type if you look upon over here so we are saying let's say there are three type of facials which are rose tulip and jasmine and the groups of respondents will be covered up in three different groups of having approximately 30 respondents each to see the randomization of the effect of the type of the facial so that we are able to see whether the masculinity has any role to play with reference to the overall choice for a particular facial if we look upon on the very first table out here and if we try to look upon from the rose perspective so it is 10% of males who are preferring in fact the rose as a facial and it is dominated by 85% when it comes to fail female right so if we try to look upon in this particular reference if a person is having a masculinity orientation very very high the logical and obvious choice has to be the tulip because it is more preferred by male but that is where we are having our moderator to move on with reference to masculinity where the intercases can move up with respect to the rose tulip or a jasmine for that matter and therefore if we try to look upon the expected result will move in this way that compliant consumers having high sense of masculinity 
will prefer A. Whereas compliant consumers having low sense of masculinity prefers B. So the moment we are saying the preference for A or B, that is what we try to look upon, that how masculinity as a moderator will affect a choice for a particular beauty service which comes in different versions of facial products which are A, B and C for that matter. This is the way in which we want to move on and probably if this goes well, we also try to look upon in terms of the aggressive as well as to the detached personality. This is what we have for the presentation. Any comments? Thank you. Thank you. Slight change. I thought maybe a slight change, but that's okay. Is it is in there? So we change the slide from here itself. No? We change from. Here. You want to leave the pin? I can explain. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, very good morning. Um, as you can see, uh, our topic for today is whether mindfulness uh, drives pro-social behavior. And um, we, uh, we tried to come to a consensus. As you can see, it's a, it's a mixed, varied group. None of us knew each other. And one of the first things that we were trying to do in terms of finding motivation together was finding a common topic. And these are our backgrounds. Uh, I work in the area of sales promotions, uh, exchange offers, um, sustainability to some extent. Um, our Satyam works on BOP markets, Pankaj works on BOP marketing, and then online consumer behavior. So you'd wonder where pro-social behavior came from. Um, we started with uh, Jagdish Chet's paper on mindful consumption and um, realized that there aren't any meaningful skills currently in the market. And we say, okay, what is mind? What is the, uh, what happens when there is mindful consumption and where is it all coming from? Where is the construct coming from? And um, uh, all of us, at least on this front, have found a common interest, which is pro-social behavior. Um, and uh, what could lead to pro-social behavior? What is it that could lead to pro-social behavior? So what is pro-social behavior to begin with? Uh, we have looked at pro-social behavior literature to some extent, found out that pro-social behavior can be attributed either through uh, a, a situation, which means that you have, um, you have a situation at hand that requires you to behave more pro-socially. Uh, how it's contrasted, an example is that you're walking on the road and uh, somebody drops a whole heap of papers and uh, you may say that's okay, I don't need to kind of help in this scenario, but uh, there's an accident and then uh, pro-social behavior kicks in and you try and help this person because he's in an accident. Uh, similarly, I, we also looked for uh, where else it could come from and it could come from altruism, um, which again is, um, is an inert uh, value system or it could come from reciprocity, which means if you help me, I help you too. Uh, that, could, that could be one other reason. So some of them are situational, like I told you in the case of an accident, 
or there could be individual factors like altruism which comes from internally. But uh, wh what pro-social behavior says is that it's either learned, like operant learning, uh, as a child you are taught that you should share, you should give, you should, you should be more uh, social in your group and that leads to pro-social behavior or it's from a situation. Now we are looking at something completely different then in that case. Um, literature on mindfulness is divided between the East and the West. Uh, okay. Um, should I use? Um, so mindfulness has been studied uh, uh, from two perspectives. One is the Eastern perspective, and the other is the Western. Uh, as you can see, literature, so uh, documented literature, as far as our journals are concerned, has. Uh, um, uh, earlier work on the Western Front. So the Western Front looks at social cognition and how social cognition affects, um, um, as in, um, can lead to mindfulness. And uh, there is Eastern literature, which is not as old as the Western, but in practice, I'm sure it is uh, far, far predated than the Western literature. And that talks about how uh, Buddhism practices teach you mindfulness. Uh, but what um, both of them agree on, so although they use, uh, so this is like process and um, product patent, patenting, uh, both of, uh, while the processes are different, how you practice mindfulness through social cognition and how you practice it through Buddhism practices are different. Uh, but both of them agree that mindfulness is an innate capacity or ability which is naturally available to individuals. Yeah? And it may differ in its degree but it is, a, it is something that we have access to uh, and can be accessed. Uh, so that is where our uh, motivation came from to work on a model. Uh, we, uh, what we are proposing is that irrespective of who you are, uh, unlike how um, pro-social behavior says that, you know, what is taught to you is what you learn best. Um, but um, apart from that, and also not saying that it is, it does need to be situational, uh, we're using the Eastern method of, uh, practicing, pros uh, of practicing mindfulness and uh, trying to find out if that practice can, uh, in situations, lead to pro-social behavior. Um, I haven't covered all literature, but there is some literature that uh, uh, Professor Lee was telling us about yesterday where she said that if you, um, uh, if, um, uh, you know, monks were, um, were given a scenario where there is um, uh, pain in the society, they are able to um, uh, solve it or uh, positively look at that aspect rather than empathize. So more than empathy, there is a positive aspect to it, which is where uh, we brought in these moderators saying that when the uh, self-awareness has been studied in the context of both mindfulness and pro-social behavior. Um, but uh, we felt that self-awareness uh, in the ways that it has been studied looks at it as a negative aspect. That it makes you aware that you're not pro-social enough and therefore now you say, oh, I'll look at me, why am I like this? And try to be more pro-social. Whereas the uh, purpose of life looks at it more positively. Saying that while you are mindful, uh, you find a better purpose for life, which is more positive attitude towards your society and therefore display pro-social behavior. Now, since all of us are in the consumer behavior track and we wanted to look at uh, consumer behavior application, uh, we have looked at a scenario of uh, discounts or uh, uh, rather incentives uh, to behavior. So um, this is where, so a little bit of self-awareness. Uh, uh, this is the literature on self-awareness. We have looked at both. So like I told you, in self-awareness, there is connect between mindfulness and self-awareness, and also self-awareness and pro-social behavior. Both of these have been studied in the context of the Western way of thinking, which is um, uh, the, uh, the cognitive um, you know, measures of uh, pro-social behavior. Uh, whereas um, uh, in the purpose of life, you're talking that there's a self, um, there's an embedded personality or behavioral change that happens. And because of this behavioral change where our purpose of life shifts, uh, we see better uh, pro-social behavior in, in this context. So our context here is an exchange offer. Uh, one ex as you can see, one exchange offer tells you, uh, let's read the vignette first. 
uh, that's the vignette you own. And th this is a popular brand in India. Uh, fastest selling sells only online. Um, it has offline stores as well, but it's, uh, it does very well in the mid segment, uh, which is why it's really popular. It's neither too expensive nor too inexpensive. Uh, you're looking at uh, two scenarios. One says that you own a Redmi Note 3 and you've been using it for the uh, last 18 months. Uh, if you were to exchange it today in the market, its current resale value would stand at uh, 2,000 rupees. And then it says that Xiaomi is offering you a 20% exchange offer for the new uh, model, which is the uh, Note 5 Pro. And uh, this 20% of the new price works out to be 2,000 rupees. Uh, the other scenario, what the only thing that changes is that Xiaomi is now offering you a 10% exchange offer, and the other 10% would go to a social cause. So what social cause, where, et cetera, has to be pre-tested. Uh, but the idea is that we will look at uh, both, before recruiting people into this experiment, we will look for at least uh, moderate product knowledge, moderate brand knowledge, and uh, look at some causes uh, which uh, you know resonate with the, with the audience. So once we have done this, um, where we were divided on uh, is whether this should be a within group design or a, a between group design, whether they should see both these scenarios and be allowed to choose, or whether they should see only one uh, in, in this case. So in one, uh, we uh, want to um, do the mindfulness exercise with one group uh, where they do the body scan or uh, follow the Buddhist way of uh, getting uh, mindful, and then check whether there is any preference shift or uh, preference increase for the one that has better pro-social indicators, like the 10% uh, donation that comes into, or the 10% charity, or 10% towards the cause, which you're paying out of your pocket, which you could have otherwise got back in terms of money. And um, as against a control group who does not go through the mindfulness exercise and again sees these two options and uh, picks one over the other. Uh, we are predicting, naturally, we will use ANOVA for main effects, AMOS for the mediating relationship. Uh, um, what, um, what I'm curious, as in the group was also curious about, is that, uh, uh, so there is a literature on self-awareness. Through AMOS, we are trying to see if uh, our hypothesis of purpose of life whole, uh, is a better model to explain pro-social behavior as against the self-awareness uh, uh, model, uh, you know, the mediator. So um, um, that would be interesting for us. So we are expecting definitely to find that mindfulness will induce more subjects to choose uh, the condition to where there is some amount of uh, donation or pro-social behavior as against not. Um, and the control group should not therefore show the, the same effect. And uh, pro-social behavior would, should be mediated by purpose of life, which should be a better model than um, uh, the the self-awareness model. Um, yeah, that's about it. All right. Uh, so what do we do? Let's, let's take a break now. OK. Uh, this break will be how long? Uh, till 10 party? Because uh, 20 minutes. Right, 20 minutes. So we come back here at 10 minutes. There's 25 minutes at the end. OK. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's okay. So, the tea's so back to the long agent. Please settle down. Please sit down. The rule of game is six. Can you? Yeah. Uh, good morning. I think you should start. Yeah, you start. So uh, we are group three from CV track, and uh, all the four came with the different backgrounds. So it was very difficult for us to reach at a top. So uh, it was very difficult for us to reach at a topic, and finally, after a lot of deliberations, we decided this topic. Friends turning four at Facebook, uh, a study of self-esteem and self-control issues. So uh, uh, there is a lot of evidence which is coming from literature that uh, social networking sites are being used for different purposes. People go on social network sites for different purposes, for leisure, 
and uh, there is the evidence coming that people spend near about 10 to 12 hours per day on social networking sites to have an interaction, to have uh, uh, different things being discussed on there. So uh, we were really interested to explore that, you know, what is happening and how it is leading to different type of activities. And so there is, there is different, when we looked at the literature, there are three things which came out, social comparison, uh, social rank theory of depression, and self-control, uh, which are leading to guilt, self-shame, or self-doubt. So there is evidence from the literature which is coming, which is indicating that when people are using more social networking sites and after uh, they log out, uh, there is self-shame which is uh, pre prevalent because of the wastage of time, uh, because of maybe there is no productivity coming out. It may have some impact on uh, your daily, uh, daily work, daily, daily life. So uh, people feel shameful about it that I have spent so much time and it is not leading to any output in terms of what I was doing there. So uh, these three uh, um, uh, theories are basically indicating a lot of evidence in relation to use of social networking sites, particularly Facebook. Okay, so then uh, we reached at, we taken two papers which are contradictory in context. And we reached at uh, uh, the conclusion that we should look at uh, to bridge uh, these two papers together to bring out a model which can help us in understanding this context more better. So the first paper, uh, Wilcox and Stephen are talking about uh, our close friends, the enemy online social network. So basically indicating it's an experimental research design where they indicated that uh, the people who are close in the network and if you have the interaction with them, that leads to uh, mm, better self-esteem, okay? So improvement in self-esteem, and uh, uh, it, the study also reports the impact of body mass index and higher credit card debt on the relationship between use of social networks and behavior. So there is further a lot of, they done approximately seven experiments from different angles, and they reached the conclusion that, uh, one, that those who are close in the network are having an impact, Further, those are having close in the network can impact what you buy, and it further leads to uh, the last two dimensions, which is high credit card debt and the uh, body mass index. The second study, which is pub published in Journal of Experimental Psychology, the paper discusses passive users of Facebook resulting in decline of effective well-being. So it is contradictory. Previous study said that there is positive, and second study said it is negative. So uh, uh, it is again experimental design, and uh, results from, uh, came out significant. So uh, what we did, we tried to map the context of the two and come out with a conceptual model. Uh, the best part was, out of the four in the group, we never did experiment. Okay, so it was very challenging for us. I still think there are, there are loopholes uh, in our proposal just because of the reason there was no background of doing the experiment. I'm coming from uh, quantitative background, so uh, it was very challenging for us to understand how to do the experiment, what it is, and uh, then how to reach out the conclusion, how to identify the variable, and then go for it. So what we are proposing is Facebook users leads, leads to high self-esteem for those with strong ties. Then it leads to low self-control, okay? So because when, uh, when you are having strong ties, you, what the other person is telling you, you are going to lose control and do the actions according to it. So self-control is lost. And we are adding the second paper dimension to the first one. So the first three are coming from the first paper. Last one is coming from the second paper. We are again uh, saying that when you are losing self-control, there will be again low self-esteem. Okay, so this is the basic framework uh, which we are proposing, and uh, uh, it, data will be collected through a laboratory experiment. We have just tried to create the experiment, but I feel there are loopholes, so what we are trying to propose is controlled versus uncontrolled groups. Uh, two groups, one uses Facebook, another uh, is not using Facebook, but during that time, 
they will be uh, so they are not right now on the facebook we will try to ask them you know what happens on social networking sites and they are going to write down uh, a paragraph or something about the use of uh, facebook and then uh, we are looking at the per, uh, the group who is on the facebook to uh, give the five close friends names and how they matter to them and on that basis uh, we will try to look uh, look at that what in what decisions they have impacted their behavior and after doing this we will look at using a scale on rosenberg which is a self esteem scale to get the data and we have not yet identified the self control instrument which we will be trying to look at and then uh, comparing the data by using the regression and uh, what we are expecting from here uh, uh, the facebook use leads to lower self control and higher self esteem people has already been established the first study indicated that wherein it is clearly established that uh, uh, the people who are from the close ties are having a positive impact on self esteem and further leads to uh, mm, uh, lower self control and our study will further prove that the people when are having self lower self control it will further lead to lower self esteem that's it all right thank you i think we will send the comments later okay thank you thank you let's go to the next one So good morning to all. Uh, first of all, uh, I am Tapas, uh, research scholar in JGBS, and my group mates Puneet and uh, Dr. Vaishali. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, Professor Angelina and uh, as well as Professor Jaydi because they have just given us some feedback when we are just preparing the draft. So moving on, this is the title. Actually, this title is from my research. It's not from CB. as i am working on organizational behavior so this is the title of relation of workplace spirituality with organized citizenship behavior mediating the role of organizational commitment so to make it more clear i just want to give uh, a background nowadays this is the condition of the workplaces that we used to face there are some burnouts employee deficiencies withdrawal cognitions and there are different unethical practices that individual and organizational use to face nowadays so this is our motivation and as well as the background basing on which we have taken up this so we th we think as a group so that there is a need for spiritual values which should be inculcated at a workplace to make it more ethical so basing on that because most of the uh, are from marketing here so i just thought to give some operational definitions which are backed up with literature so workplace spirituality is a term which talks about notions of meaning purpose being being to connected with each other and uh, which the next definition has been given by geklon which talks about it's a framework of organizational values which evidence in the culture and like that so the next definition i had just given from organizational commitment which is a, which is from the seminal paper of chatman and the third about organizational citizenship behavior which also i have taken from a seminal paper that's from organ 1988 so moving on uh because of the time constraint what i have taken is i tr just try to take in literature review from some of the seminal papers and some of the latest papers so i just try to find the link between workplace spirituality and organizational commitment and as well as ocb so the first paper which i put it here of 2016 which has been published by a special journal of aom that is called journal of management spirituality and religion which they recently started so they they have uh, they just reviewed the literature of workplace spirituality for more than 14 years and they just try to give different dimensions of that 
So in like in the same way in organizational commitment also we have taken some seminal papers as well as some latest papers which tries to link workplace spirituality with organizational commitment. There are studies it says that how workplace spirituality is going to enhance organizational commitment. So usually organizational commitment has got three notions which is one is effective commitment, one is normative commitment and which is continuous commitment. So all these three mixes up there and try to talk about the commitment levels. So in the next in organization citizenship behavior like there are also studies by you and Agrawal where they try to link spirituality with how it enhances organization citizenship behavior. So while we are doing all this literature review, we found out that there are very less studies which is going to connect between workplace spirituality and OCB along with the mediating of organizational commitment. So we are proposing this model where the IV is workplace spirituality and the DV is OCB and the MV we are putting as organizational commitment. So basing on which uh, we have got these three hypotheses like uh, WPS that is workplace spirituality is positively related with OCB. The second hypothesis is WPS is positively related with uh, organizational commitment. The third one is OC is positively related with OCB which we try to see from our study. So these are the data requirements. We thought sample size we should go for 500 and the technique we are going to use for convenience sampling. And the description I just given is we given that uh, employees with 5 to 10 years of managerial experience with MNCs of Indian origin. So next is the data collection we are going for surveys and we are going for some scales which is already established in the literature and those all the scales are multidimensional scales. To just give a thought, I just put at the names of the scales and the items. Like for WPS, we are going to use for Dutchan scale uh, because he's the guy who has developed an Asian context scale for measuring workplace spirituality. The remaining scales which has been used are mostly in US context. So we are going to use this scale which has got 37 items and it, it is measured in five point Likert scale. And for OC, we are going to use Mayers and Ellen, which is one of most used scale in commitment literature. And for organization behavior, we are going to use Diane's scale, which is also a mostly highly used, which is of 34 items. Now the, for analysis, we are going to use structural equation modeling, and we'll also use MOS there. And we try to go for correlation and regulation analysis because we just want to see what is the relation. Is there any positive relation between workplace spirituality and organization commitment and with organization citizens behavior? So there comes our expected results. So we just want to see that is there any positive relation between these three constructs? Thank you. No, no, no. Actually, I'm just focusing on OCB, that uh, the employees who are taking it. That, that variable may be important. But when you start doing this, you see yeah. all that. And also, yeah. I think you have to distinguish between spirituality and religious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's probably a different Yeah, that I will do because of the concept to push Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. 
Um, we have a four-member team, uh, Dipti Man here, uh, Shriram, myself, Paramita, and Sachin. Um, <clears throat> what we are trying to understand is whether altruistic behavior um, has, uh, you know, what drives altruistic behavior. And of course, there can be many antecedents, but here we are specifically looking at whether there is a difference between empathy and sympathy in driving altruistic behavior. Um, to make you understand what is the difference between the two, I'll give an example. Um, what is sympathy? For example, say if you are, if you are uh, on a street crossing and there is somebody who comes to beg, and the person who comes to beg is exactly your son or daughter's age, you know, what you feel at that time, we are proposing is sympathy. Because you, you kind of cringe, you feel bad about it, and you want to just get away from that situation. So that is what we are calling sympathy. Empathy, on the other hand, is something where you can really relate to the person there, and you feel that you can make a difference in some way. For example, say, uh, if, uh, if you are a woman who is working in an office or a university, whatever your situation might be, and you see that, and you are a person who uh, you know, has a history of a severe menstrual pain, and you know that the janitor who comes to clean your room uh, on a particular day is facing a similar kind of problem, but if she uh, stays away from job or her workplace, uh, she, there will be a, a wage reduction, a wage cut. So at that time, what you feel we propose is empathy. That is, you really feel like you are in the shoes of the other person, and maybe you can do something about it. While So you can make a difference. You can do something about it. While in the case of the beggar, and there are so many others, you really cannot do anything about it. So that's the difference that we are proposing. Accordingly, uh, the background is that you know there are many charitable organizers. Why is this relevant in a consumer research perspective? Is that there are many uh, organizations who are soliciting donations for charitable purpose, and that is although we would not like to call it big business, but it is big. Um, uh, according to some sources, uh, charitable donations uh, exceed uh, uh, 500 billion US dollars in United States alone. But, and there is a huge variance in the kind of causes and the kind of victims uh, for which you might be asked to donate money. Now, NGOs therefore need to do the proper messaging, although this work will not per se be about messaging, but we are trying to understand uh, what really drives altruism? What really drives pro-social uh, behavior? So accordingly, the problem statement is that when we identify with the victim or the cause, we are likely to be more altruistic than when we are not like, and this is nothing, this is the what thing that, uh, you know, what uh, aspect that uh, Jaydeep was talking about the other day. But the why aspect is more important. Like what we are proposing is that when you feel sympathy, you might be donating less than when you are uh, feeling empathy. Uh, I'll now leave uh, to, for, uh, to Deepthi Man to carry it forward. Thank you. Thanks, Varumita. OK, hi there again. So uh, there's quite a decent amount of literature on uh, sympathy and empathy. And different researchers have tried to tease, apart, tease them apart. The essential difference that we see in the uh, literature, OK, it seems I have to speak here only. OK, so the essential difference, it seems, between sympathy and empathy is in sympathy, both of them are affective reactions. That's the way researchers see them now. Uh, Eisenberg and Miller, for example, in their uh, highly cited psychological bulletin paper, 1987, uh, what they mention is, in sympathy, there is an affective reaction to the other's uh, state, but it's more of distress. It's, it's not kind of feeling the other person's reaction, but it's more of distress. Empathy, on the other hand, is a feeling of, uh, is, is mirroring the other person's feeling. Uh, uh, and the way they, they, they define this is, is vicarious experiencing of the other person's feeling. So that's essentially the difference between the two. Uh, there is, of course, other literature which talks about altruism and sympathy. Uh, we'll, uh, let me quickly jump to the constructs that we have used. So uh, our independent variable uh, uh, that we would like to start off with here, and incidentally, there is no literature, at least we did not come out uh, with any literature which has all these constructs together. So we uh, thought of, we, we looked at the literature and we saw, uh, you know, we also, uh, with from personal experience, uh, found out that an identification with the cause, so that's a feeling of oneness with the cause, 
how much I also, um, uh, uh, know, I feel commonality with the cause. So that's an important, uh, that, that, that is an uh, important way in which NGOs can drive, you know, uh, individuals to feel uh, similarity with the cause and drive donations upwards. So identification is our dependent variable, empathy and sympathy are what we propose are two mediating mechanisms which will finally lead to altruistic behavior. Now, altruistic behavior is a large construct, uh, and we are, uh, as of this point of time, trying to see it in two different ways, two different variables. One is time taken to donate, and the other is amount donated. Uh, so the way we are looking at it right now is that when there's a feeling of sympathy, that is, when there's a feeling of distress, and I want to move out of the situation, the time taken will be lesser. So if there's a request that comes to me, I feel distressed, not so much of a personal connection with that cause, I want to donate something quickly and move away. Whereas if the identification is high, the second example that uh, Paramita was talking of, I would tend to take maybe some more time, you know, see what all that I can do, and uh, that would reflect in, in, in you know, a higher time taken to donate. Uh, uh, the, the connection with amount Right now we are also debating, but then uh, we also, you know, uh, maybe what we have come to so far is that there will be difference in amounts as well. So in case of sympathy, the amount will tend to be lower. In case of empathy or, or a stronger connection with the cause, the empathy, uh, the amount donated will be higher. Uh, so these are the two hypotheses that I just mentioned. Uh, as of now, we were only able to thought, think of one experiment where we'll be manipulating the uh, identification. So we know with uh, uh, priming, so you know, lower identification uh, versus higher identification, and elicit either sympathy in case of low identification or empathy in case of high identification. At least that's what we propose uh, will happen. Uh, so it's a simple one by two kind of a design, and see what are the differences that come across in these two situations. And uh, thank you for your patient listening. We look forward to your guidance. Thank you. <laughs> You are right, sir. There is a lot of literature which says that they are correlated and they can, one of them can lead to the other. So yeah, we'll have to, uh, I, uh, so the way we were thinking of it is we'll have to kind of tease them apart in such a way that it is either empathy eliciting or sympathy eliciting. So that will be more of a design function. Thank you for that point. Another clarification. Yes, somebody has already done the distinction between empathy and sympathy. Yes. So what's new here? Yeah, so, uh, What's new from okay. That's right, sir. So one is a uh, uh, lot of NGOs face this problem. In fact, I keep on getting and uh, you do also, you know, in terms of donation amount. So what can we do as marketeers to help NGOs, you know, to elicit higher donations? That's one. So the the, the contest we are uh, looking at is an application. application. And secondly, uh, though these two constructs have been seen as predecessors of altruistic behavior. But how to drive this, uh, you know, what kind of messaging or what can a, a firm do, you know, to use these mechanisms to their benefit, uh, you know, is something probably we are looking for the first time. Yes. Please, 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 literature, sometimes we get a paper and it's like, oh my God, we've already done it. And, and then we read our data and it seems like it's guilt. So initially when we had proposed, we had talked about guilt, that we changed it to sympathy and empathy. And of course we have to do a lot more literature and we really tease out the things. But we felt that this is the primary motivation to tease out the two things and see whether it would be less or more. No, that's that's something that you know we are thinking of. There's literature 
from the. Let me, let me address that question. That's precisely what we are also struggling with. What I have pushed. So the literature also says that empathy is the more cognitive component, while sympathy is the more affective component. Do you know, uh, what we felt was uh, that um, it is a cringe inside. And if people are so controlled, you really can't do that with people. So you know, there are such levels of rumor. What can you do about it? On the other hand, there is a person who is coming there. And uh, if you are interacting with her on a daily basis, maybe you can put in a word somewhere. Maybe you can, can talk to the administration. Maybe something can be done for women like that, rather than just, because you have been in her shoes in some way. So there is more of a heart connect in some ways in the second situation that we are talking about. Right. I mean, the literature does show that the higher empathy, the more the emotion. Yeah. Right? Yes, uh, yes. But, that but is it feels composing that basically they still donate, but the donation is actually is through sympathy. Uh, yeah. So we're seeing the sympathy situation a little bit lesser because we are kind of trying, to, there's a time component here somewhere. Like you said, we are not got through very clearly, it's still preliminary, but there's a time component. And it's like, let me just give something and run over the situation because you can't really face it. So, in a way, there is identification. There is identification. We are not saying there's no identity. There is identification, but it is making me cringe so much. And I feel out of control, and therefore I give the money and go out. And the money will be lesser. And I think uh, what ca can be an important conclusion is that less versus more part. This is what we felt. Like I said, more experiments. And uh, uh, Diktima has done some experiments. None of us have done it. I'm, I'm a qualitative person. He comes from sales background, so he said, let's just try to know. But we get your point, Angela, that we need to be more clear on the theoretical yeah. drive from identification to empathy and individual sympathy. So we'll look into it. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. That's right. OK. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we have got the Nigeria group. Yes. MA1. Uh, MG1. Whatever we call it. Good morning, pan yeah. uh, good morning, panel members. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, on behalf of my team, uh, Dr. Panita, uh, Dr. Sunita, and Sujo is not here. Uh, I take this opportunity to present our research proposal on uh, influencer marketing. Uh, before I proceed, you know, just to give you a quick prelude, uh, if one were to use, uh, uh, if one were to uh, search the term influencer marketing in Google Trends, one could see there is an increasing interest in influencer marketing. This data was taken for the last five years. I could see an increasing interest in topic influencer marketing. And I also see companies today uh, are, are spending a lot on influencer marketing campaigns. I look at you know the brands will spend close to dollar one billion on influencer marketing by 2018. And uh, if you look at this data point, you know, the expected change in the company's influence marketing budget in 2017, according to US e-marketer data, you see uh, many marketing managers are interested in increasing their marketing budget on influence marketing campaigns. So now what are the roadblocks? You know, I, I just ran through MSI and AMA uh, websites, and 
uh, when, I, when I was running through influencer marketing to know more about to understand influencer marketing, I came across three fundamental blocks that was mentioned in American Marketing Association papers. One is uh, how, do, how to identify relevant influencers. That's a big question companies are facing. How do I, are they appropriate for my brand? How do I choose? Are there any approaches to selecting the right influencer? The second one is how to build an effective engagement strategy. How do I effectively engage my customers, my target group through influencers, or how do I, in fact, engage my influencers? I'm talking about influencing at two levels. One, brands engaging influencers productively, constructively, and brands influencers engaging customers. And how to choose meaningful metrics and measurement approaches to study the impact of uh, influencer marketing so our problem tries to, we, we are kind of, you know, I mean, you know, in a group, you know, with varied research interests, it's always difficult to find a common ground somehow, you know. I mean, the first day we were spending, first, you know, we spent entire one hour, you know, uh, discussing what topic should we do. So uh, based on this, you know, we arrived at this problem, uh, understanding influencer marketing and its impact on mindset metrics. So there are two areas which we are interested in understanding. One, you know, how far content characteristics affect mindset metrics. When I mean content characteristics, I will brief on content characteristics in the later part when I explain conceptual framework. What do I mean content characteristics is, you know, how useful, suppose you're reading a blog or you're watching an infographic video done by an influencer, how useful that video is for you, how credible the trustworthiness of that video, I mean the content you see in that video, the trustworthiness of the blog, for instance, so that's what I meant, content characteristics. So I'm interested in studying how far content characteristics affect mindset metrics in terms of brand awareness, liking, and consideration, and purchase intention. Uh, the second factor I'm interested in studying is what is the role of influencer characteristics in, in, uh, in impacting mindset metrics? What do I mean by influencer characteristics? Uh, the fans who follow the influencer, do they perceive them as credible, product expert or service expert? Do they perceive them to, to have expertise in the area? Are they believable? Are they relatable? Can fans relate a lot with the influencers? Are they relevant? So these are some of the areas I'm uh, looking at. So these two broad areas is what I'm interested in studying, content characteristics and role of influencer characteristics and its impact on mindset metrics. So. Uh, uh, given the time we have, you know, I, we, we just ran a quick literature review. We, we found a couple of papers on mindset metrics. I also wrote to Dr. Shubha on this topic. Uh, so Dr. Murli Mantrala gave some insights on this topic, in fact. So we, we looked into some of the papers. In fact, we, we come across a lot of papers on opinion leadership, how to measure the source credibility of an opinion leader. You know, are there any scales that measures the credibility a source credibility of an opinion leader. So we just ran through a couple of papers and also some papers on uh, message credibility. So the culmination of that, as I said, you know, we haven't done extensive review of literature. There is a lot to study. Uh, basically, the gap, a quick gap that we found was, you know, there, there has been, uh, you know, limited or no study on the influence of influencer marketing on mindset metrics. So uh, the conceptual framework is kind of in a very crude form now. So uh, we are looking at two, uh, you know, uh, the dependent variable is the mindset metric and how content characteristics and how influencer characteristics affects the mindset metrics uh, is what we, we have in mind. So uh, uh, still, you know, there are certain fuzzy areas. Uh, we, we are we are right to decide whether to do on it. Instagram, because if you look at the data points, you know, Instagram has the largest number of uh, fan base, and many companies are using Instagram as a platform to reach out to their target segment. The other platform we are looking at is blog. Should we take blog content, or should we take uh, infographic content, video-based content, or text-based content is what we, we are uh, still looking at. Uh, and the data we are trying to look at is the social media engagement data. Normally, if it is a blog, for instance, you know, you have subscribers. You look at subscribers' uh, comments, the engagement data with, with that particular blog. Uh, that's what we are looking at. Uh, the method of data collection, as I said, you know, we are looking at survey, and we are also looking at text mining. Uh, 
Uh, rapid miner is what we are looking at, uh, or even Twitter or analysis. We, 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 uh, these are very fuzzy areas now. We haven't decided anything on that. But uh, these are some of the things that we, we discussed. And we thought maybe we, these are some of the options that are available to do, for example, text mining and text analytics. Maybe we can uh, do some analysis and find out whether the sentiments are positive, whether the sentiments are neutral or negative. Uh, this is what we are planning to do. And we expect the interplay of content characteristics and influencer characteristics to have an impact on mindset metrics. So that's about it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Hello? Huh? Hello? Okay, okay. All right? No, you want to use both? No, no. Is it okay? Will you yeah. okay. All right. Uh, so, well, uh, our team was very inspiring because we had, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Joshua, who was already a PhD. We have, uh, you know, Amanish Luhan, who is a research scholar. He's pursuing. 
and uh, me, who is just deciding upon, you know, uh, how to carve out the journey of uh, writing a research paper. So the study was quite precise, and it's simple in the sense it looked at studying the consumer's perception of online visual merchandising and its impact on the buying behavior of a consumer in the apparel market in India, that to online. So, it, it, so when I say visual merchandising, it is being defined as a strategic presentation of a store and its merchandise, which somehow captivates the attention of the potential consumers and leads them to buy more merchandise. So this definition has been given by Diamond and Diamond and it's been refined in 2007, wherein also the other scholars who have been working on this is Heiss and he said in 2007 that the merchandise and the uh, website design also, also heightens the awareness and brings in the consumer so that he gets more satisfied to buy at the end of the uh, day. So the study looked at that. So the background of the study, I'll not go into this, but it clearly says that, the, uh, that our country has uh, 462 million users of internet in the world, right? And the world, internet world statistics reveals it very, very clearly that India is supposed to be the second largest home of internet users in the world, China being the first, 772 million users in the world, and US being the third, which has 316 million users in the world. So that was the first uh, factor. The second one, Anant Narayan, who is the CEO of uh, you know, Mintra and Zebong, he says that the current status, he, he quotes in ET uh, retail on uh, March 16, 2017, and he clearly states out that the Current online purchase in India is just 4%, which is yet to go to 16% at max in the coming three to five years. Now that's an ouch point. You have the you are the second largest internet user in the world, and you have just 4% of the people who are using the internet, you know, for online shopping. Another data from BCG says that 70% of the 90 million population which uses the internet is uh, very, very influenced by the information which is given on the website, uh, which they are, you know, from where they are gleaning uh, and put, taking up the information, but only 16% of the people end up buying the product. So that was the gap we were trying to study, and uh, we thought that we will pick up the, uh, you know, topmost four apparel uh, websites in India, Amazon, we thought Flipkart, uh, Mintra, and Zabong. These were the four sites we thought of uh, focusing in our study. So the review of the literature, of course, uh, we, we had uh, seen a couple of papers, and a major work in this has been done by Diamond and Diamond. Uh, Roglu, 2001, has got a lot of inputs in the literature where he clearly says that the uh, cues of visual merchandising online are based on a high task environment and a low task relevant environment. Most of the sites when you go to require a website registration for buying, which is a low task environment, but the, the presentation and the appeal of the merchandise is supposed to be a high task uh, uh, you know, relevant uh, environment. Uh, so I'll skip off this. So the research questions we had in mind was what is the current status and the pattern of online visual merchandising situation for e-com websites in India? Question two, how does OVM operate on e-commerce websites for apparel retail specifically in the country? And third, does it influence the consumer decision making? The objectives were split it further and it looked into the online uh, current patterns uh, in the country, or specifically for apparel retails in e-com websites. It also uh, wants, we also want to study the influence and the effectiveness of the online visual merchandising elements. The third is, we are going to analyze the consumer's perception of the OVM practices for apparel retail in e-commerce, understanding the moderating effect of technology, 
the outline relationship between the elements of OVM and the intent to purchase and finally draw out a model, validate it to see what are the elements which actually influence the consumer buying process. It's as simple as that, if I see a t-shirt which is there on a website, will I be more enticed to buy it? Or if I see it on a mannequin, will I be more you know, heightened to buy it? Or my you know, sales will spike if I see myself in the t-shirt that how do I look? So does a 360 degree modeling or any kind of an artificial intelligence in place would really give it a facilitation to bring in more purchases uh, of the apparels online. So the theoretical framework was borrowed from the grounded theory of SOR, which is stimulus organism response model. And it's a very well-known model given by Mehrabi and Russell in 1974. It simply says the stimulus is the online environmental cues, which arouses the, of course, the uh, senses, the, both the emotional and the cognitive. And it will ultimately result in the outcome, which is a behavior uh, to buy or not to uh, buy. This is the literature we tried studying, and it uh, is exactly what I uh, mentioned about the high task and the low task uh, uh, elements. So registration is website registration here. So uh, web navigation, web uh, graphics, and the product demonstration, this is what we will be focusing on as the elements of uh, uh, visual merchandising, which impacts the decision to uh, by. So this is as simple as a model which resonates the uh, Mehrabian Russell model and it's the proposed conceptual uh, model which, which talks about elements of OVM as, as the stimulus and the purchase intention as the uh, response. Of course, we discussed going further that how descriptive should be the research design and how do we collect the um, uh, data. We also thought before uh, finally under, you know, picking up the uh, elements of the uh, visual merchandising which are uh, there on the literature. We'll conduct a pilot study, maybe a, a focused group interview. And we talk to the people and through a discussion questionnaire and trying to try to understand what is that which is important for them to buy online, specifically apparels, and what is that which makes them away from buying an apparel. So those factors would also be considered and you know, woven in into the question as which we go further. And of course, these are the set of elements we were trying to study. Uh, we know it's in a very, very uh, first iteration format. And uh, as suggested and discussed in the team, we thought the statistical tools which can be helpful to uh, derive at certain uh, conclusion uh, which helps the study to uh, go further will be the ones which are mentioned here, uh, the descriptive analysis and of course a multivariate regression model to come up and close what is the uh, model we are trying to propose. So this is what it is. Thank you. Thank you.